Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Greek art, a fresh look at ancient art. We're going to explore the wide range of Greek art, which formed the foundation of much of the Western uh, world's art. Uh, for more than 3,000 years, artists' achievements, uh, artists' achievements, oh boy, who, who wrote this? <laughs> Artists achieved the finest results in sculpting, vase painting, and bronze casting. Particular attention will be paid to the comprehensive collection that was on view at Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. We're going to reacquaint ourselves with the gods and goddesses, heroes and, heroes and heroines of ancient Greece. And this is led by art historian Mary Woodward, who serves as a guide at several historic New England properties. She previously served as public programs coordinator and educator at the Concord Museum. She has a BA in art history from Furman University and an MA in art history from Emory University. She has more than 40 years of experience in museums of all shapes and sizes from the comprehensive collection at the Cleveland Museum of Art to the one room log cabin birthplace of President James K. Polk. So again, we thank the uh, Tewksbury Library and the Tewksbury Cultural Council for co-sponsoring. Uh, we thank our friends in Rockport for helping promote. And so all 120 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mary for joining us this morning. And Mary, you can take it away. Thanks all so right. much. <laughs> thank you so much, Robert. It's so rousing and it sounds like I'm a prize fighter coming out of the corner. So thank you so much. And good morning, everybody, and thank you uh, to the Tewksbury Library and, and Rockport Library for your support. Appreciate it. So yes, it's a fresh look at ancient art, and we're focusing uh, our look today on the collection, as Robert said, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. We're going to explore uh, some of their recent reinstallation. That was 2021, so pretty recent reinstallation of Greek art. While we're there, virtually, we're gonna talk about how the MFA is using new technologies and presentations to discuss the way sculptures looked in ancient times. Hint, spoiler alert, it wasn't, they weren't all white. Uh, there's a new video installation there in the galleries, which charmingly describes the development of red figure vase painting. If you're not familiar with that now, don't worry, you will be by the end of this time. And we're gonna look at the innovative ways that they're presenting themes in Greek life and culture, and then illustrating those themes with examples from the collection. So you may ask yourself, how does the MFA get all of this Greek art? A number of Bostonians had collections already and were happy to donate them to the museum when it opened in 1876. Then in the 1880s, the museum was involved in two important archaeological digs, one in Egypt and one in Turkey, that uncovered artifacts, many of which came to the museum as a result of their sponsorship. They soon established a classical department, and a man named Edward Perry Warren, who was a Harvard grad but living in Britain, set out to collect the finest pieces he could from the European art market to give to the museum. Um, he developed an expertise in ancient art. And what's particularly notable was and unusual for the time was that Mr. Warren kept meticulous records of his purchases, their provenance, where they said they were from, where he bought them, where um, who he bought them from. So that's important information. Uh, any museum needs that information these days to, to look after an object's provenance. Currently, there are about 17,000 Greek and Roman objects in the museum's collection, about 8,000 of those, almost half of them are coins. One of the areas where the collection excels is in Greek pottery, and we're going to make that our focus today, along with Greek sculpture. I'm going to be presenting the dates in the format used by the museum and, and other museums. Um, BCE that you see there stands for Before Common Era, what we used to say was BC, and CE, Common Era, what was the old AD designation. We simply have to look at the front of the MFA to grasp the importance of Greek culture to our country. Many of the institutions and systems that we use today find their roots in ancient Greece. 
It's been the political, cultural, educational, artistic, and architectural role model for us. So I think it's incredibly important to revisit those original works, and that's what the MFA has done. They're taking a fresh, as unbiased as possible, discerning look at the artistic achievements of the Hellenes. That's the Greeks' name for themselves. One author states, without hyperbole, which is a Greek word, that the Greeks created the heritage upon which the modern Western world was constructed. Now, after about 1100 BCE, after the collapse of an earlier Mycenaean culture, a civilization arose across the Greek Isles and mainland, one that would grow, uh, go on to generate masterpieces of art and architecture, innovations in science and mathematics, compelling literature and theatrical performances, philosophical and political systems that continue to resonate today. That's how another author describes the importance of ancient Greece. One thing that distinguishes the Greeks from other cultures, for instance, the ancient Egyptians, is the fact that the Greeks pushed development. They pushed forward their culture, their ideas, their arts. They were interested in experimentation. They did not remain relatively unchanged over the thousand or so years of their history. Unchanging was important to the Egyptians, but not to the Greeks. And because of this, it's possible to trace their development in the field of Greek ceramics, um, because changes there are easily identifiable uh, in painted pottery. So we're going to take a few minutes and go through the procession of the development, really, in the uh, painted vase painting for the Greek culture. Uh, the clearest way to note these changes will be for us to pay attention to how the human body is represented. What we um, are going to see happening is the result of really an increased direct observation of the body and its movement. So we'll start out with stick figures, uh, but very quickly you'll find that the Greek artists move convincingly into um, rounded, convincingly rounded bodies. Now, for those of you who might be potters out there, I wish I was a potter. I don't know how to do it. I'd like to. Um, let me say that these vessels are for the most part wheel thrown, um, but sometimes they made use of molds. The Greeks developed their own different shapes for specific uses, and um, I'm going to use the words vase and pottery and vessel interchangeably, but I will give you the Greek name for that shape. So from the earliest period that we have of Greek vase painting, the geometric period, here is an early wine pitcher called an anakawe. And you can see why it's called the geometric period. These vessels were covered with uh, abstract geometric shapes. And um, this is, a, as you see, about 900 BCE. Uh, but very soon after, really, in the scheme of things, following on, we begin to see more than just geometric shapes. This tall storage jar, or amphora, uh, would have contained, it would have been used to contain the ashes of a deceased individual. And while there's no particular representation of a person on this vase yet, Scholars can tell a little bit about the person because they interpret the many horses that you see along the shoulder of the vase as a sign of wealth of the dead person. There's also where that red arrow is, that's a charming row of ducks presented on the pitch on the amphora. And between the ducks, there are dotted lines. It gives the nickname to the potter because we don't know the person's name or the artist's name, either the potter or the painter. So this is called the birdseed painter's work because of those little dots. 
Also on the body of this, you see the Greek key motif, and you see it in a number of variations here going in several different directions. And then in the close up on the right hand screen, um, quite beautifully, if you're one of those people who thinks snakes are beautiful, I'm not really one of them, but I'm going to say it, these are beautiful. Um, the potter has placed a pair of slithering snakes up the handles of the amphora. Now, snakes are usually obviously associated with the earth, but in Greek culture could be associated with the underworld as well. Large geometric vases like this one and this one are often grouped together and called diplon vases because diplon was the name of an Athens cemetery where many of them have been found. Some of them are three and four feet tall, so there's lots of space to decorate. And some show signs of repair in the past, and that suggests that they were used over and over again, that they were valued, um, maybe used by a family group, if you can imagine, over generations for the purpose of placing ashes in them. Here's an example from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So we're stepping out of the MFA for a minute. Uh, and I, I put it in in part to show you this relative size, because, of course, there's me in front and this thing is is uh, is bigger than my head. It's several feet tall. Uh, and then the detail on the lower right and the others, if you look into the other pictures, you can see some of my favorite little people from ancient Greece. I call them apple core people, and that's not exactly what they are. They're warriors who are standing behind their shields. Some of them in the upper picture are actually on chariots. You see them standing on little wheeled chariots. But I do love them. Uh, the deceased in this particular uh, terracotta crater, now it's not an amphora, it's a crater because it has a wider opening and none of those big tall handles. This is a different kind of vessel, but it's being used in the same way. The big red arrow at the top is pointing to an individual laying out horizontally. That's an image of the deceased laying on the funeral bier. And they're surrounded by a lot of mourners. And you can see their little geometric sort of hourglass shapes along the shoulder of the vase. So the images painted on this vase, on this crater, actually depict the setting in which the vase would be used, a funeral. The Greek painters move pretty quickly, again, from these sort of geometric hourglass or apple core shaped people to fully lifelike bodies. But I have to say there's a certain irresistible charm to these little round people. Now, if you know your Greek history, you've heard of the Iliad and the Odyssey, those epic poems that were passed down for, as oral stories for centuries before being written down in the 8th century BCE. They're traditionally, it's Homer that they're associated with having being the person to write them down. From this point forward, from the 8th century BCE, which is the 700s BCE, uh, many scholars believe that this was the beginning of visual storytelling for the Greeks. What I mean is in the form of theater performances, now that they have these epic stories, they want to, the theater has developed, um, and also the painted images on pots. The Iliad and the Odyssey and other myths uh, and mythologies and legends give the artists all the fodder they need, all the images and stories they need for their Greek faces. And this is the turning point really comes in about uh, in the 700s BCE. The stories provided, as one author said, endless fascination for the Greeks and provided models for good behavior with epic heroes to emulate, goods and uh, gods and goddesses to venerate, and monsters to avoid. As the geometric period gave way to the next period, which was called the Archaic, there was a wave of new motifs coming from Greece, into Greece from Eastern Mediterranean. So some of the vases and pots show elements of this oriental phase. Animals which hadn't been present before show up. Lions, sphinxes, griffins, centaurs, monsters of all kinds. And it's also the time when the stories of those epics, like Heracles's labors, 
become popular motifs for decoration. Um, so this is a plate featuring Heracles, or as the Romans called him, Hercules, pulling Cerberus. And it's painted by a man named Paceus. Hermes is the figure with the pointed hat. And he is the guide of souls. Hermes is the messenger god. Hermes is the one helping people get from A to B. And he's helping young Heracles here, the boy on, featured on the right side, uh, to pull a two-headed dog, Cerberus, whose job has been to guard the entrance to the underworld. Any Harry Potter fans? out there know that we had a Cerberus in uh, a three-headed version of Cerberus in the Harry Potter films. Importantly, this plate dating from about 510 BCE was found in an Etruscan tomb. So hold on to that thought, we're gonna come back to it. And an important fact to mention is that both potters and painters started signing their work early in the seventh century BCE, suggesting that a certain pride in the creation and elevation of this craft to the level of an art. Fewer than 1% of uh, the vases uncovered are signed, but that's still a higher percentage than other works from other Mediterranean, ancient Mediterranean cultures. Athens becomes a center for ceramic production and the largest exporter of painted pots all over the Mediterranean. And those Etruscans are people living north of Rome on the Italian peninsula at this time. Their appreciation of Greek ceramics is one of the reasons why we have so many surviving in the world today. The Etruscans fancied them so much that they used them, put them in their tombs with them when they died. They had them as grave goods. So we're gonna look at this because it gives us a close up view of some of the writing and names. This is a kylix or drinking cup, a wide shallow vessel with handles on the side. We'll see more in the future here and it's called a kylix, um, with animals labeled on it. It's signed. And on this piece, we can see not only the painter's name, and his name is Neandros, and it's just over the animal on the right. You start to see in the curl there, N-E-A-N, you can start to see Neandros spelled out. Um, it says Neandros made me well. So he was proud of his work. But he also narrates some of the animal action to the left. He's, it's written on there, a lion got this boar. Yes, he did, well done. So this piece uh, is, is charming in its way. And Neandros tells us he did it and he also gives us a scene of what is going on in the painted decoration. This piece also shows us the earliest way that potters were decorating their pots. They made a slip which is a refined slurry of the red clay that the pot is made of. And they painted the figures on it in that slip. Then they scratched through the slip to the pot's surface to create details like the fur or the faces of the animals. This is known as the black figure technique. After that painting of the slip, the pot goes through a three-stage firing process the first, in the first phase, the pot and the slip um, turn red. It's the oxidizing phase in the kiln and it whole thing turns red. In the second phase, the oxygen is cut off from the kiln and the pot and the slip on it all turn black, the reducing phase. And in the third phase, oxygen is reintroduced, air is reintroduced into the kiln the coarser clay of the pot reabsorbs the oxygen and turns red again, but the thinner slip stays black. So here's another tiny step out the door of the MFA and over to, um, oh gosh, all the way to Munich for this one, but it's important. It's not in Boston, but we need to look at it um, because it's important in the development of vase decoration it deserves to be shown. In addition to an increased direct observation of the human body that leads to more and more realistic figures on these 
thoughts, Greek artists were also focusing their curiosity and their attention to nature as well. So in this work, dating from the same period as the works we've just been looking at, we see the artist Ezekias depicting the god Dionysus on a sailboat. Look at the sail, all right? If I have any sailors out there, you're going to definitely catch what I'm about to say. Ezekias shows us the wind. Ezekias paints the sail as if it's billowing in the wind. He is showing us the physical presence of nature in his painting. Um, that's why this is such a phenomenal piece. And it's a new, it's a new realistic territory that Greek potter artists are going into. So to help explain how the Greek artists changed from the black figure painting technique that I just described to the next development, which was the red figure technique, the museum created a marvelous short video. I've put the link to it. You can watch it online without having to go to the museum, although I would encourage you to. Uh, and the video is also playing in the gallery at the museum. But basically what happened was in about 530 BCE, artists began to use the black slip to paint the backgrounds of the scenes, leaving the bodies in the red of the clay. Then details were painted in with very thin brushes with the slip. And this new style allowed for greater complexity in design. It the firing techniques were the same so that um, when it came out of the kiln, what had um, turned red or remained red were the figures and the background was now black in the slip. This replaced the black figure, the earlier technique in about 20 years. By about, in about 20 years, everything changed over. The artist who's usually credited with the invention of the red figure technique is called the Andocades painter because he's often painting pots created by a potter whose name we know was Andocades. On uh, rare occasions, painters combined the two techniques, red figure, uh, a black figure rather, the earlier one, and red figure on the same pot. You might be asking why, and I'm gonna give you the simple sassy answer because they could, <laughs> they, were, they were that good, they were showing off. And this is the work by the Andocades painter. This is, um, a uh, storage jar or an amphora, again, tall jar, tall handles, with the scene of Heracles driving a bull to sacrifice. It's the same scene on both sides, done in black figure on one side and red figure on the other by the Andocades painter. Vases like this are, since they're both red and black figure, someone thought to call them bilingual vases. So this is a bilingual piece. They are very rare, but luckily, the MFA has even another one for us to uh, enjoy. Here is another uh, two-handled jar or amphora. This one features Achilles and Ajax playing a board game. The Andocades painter, the man whose works we've just seen a couple of times now, is responsible for the red figure side. And an artist known as the Lysipides painter is the one credited with the black figure side. So what are we looking at? Well, during a lull in the Trojan War, the two most famous Greek warriors, Ajax and Achilles, play a board game. And the scene shows up on more than 150 different artifacts, and yet there's no surviving mention of it in the epic stories. Uh, but it, it clearly um, is either a wonderful figment of a person's imagination that caught on, or it's a story from the epics that we have lost. The two warriors are clearly conversing, the board game's down in between them, and they're clearly talking about and conversing about points and scoring. Um, and you can see the difference between the black figure side, uh, there on the left, the artists, uh, uh, the figures are contained within the border. Um, and then you can see, I think in a good way here, the amount of detail that you can gain by um, seeing the red figure pieces 
on the right side and how they expand out beyond the border. So now let us turn our attention to some of the themes that the museum has used to group similar objects together and tell us more about daily life in ancient Greece. In their section called Worshiping the Gods, they've made their gallery look like a Greek temple to give us a feel for what it would be like to enter that space. There are monumental or large scale sculptures would be placed in um, a temple in, as representations of the gods. They were cult statues um, and they were there for the followers, the people to give offerings to, to ask questions of and to venerate. Honoring the gods in order to gain their favor could take the form of gifts, but also it could be holding festivals pouring libations or sacrificing animals. Um, the, the temples would be staffed with priests or priestesses, depending on whether you have God or goddess at that site, uh, and they would be there to help the devout. But the buildings shouldn't be considered churches the way we might think of in a modern time, nor did the ancient Greeks have what we might consider sacred texts. They didn't texts. Um, it was a polytheistic practice, so if you were in ancient Greek, you would have your pick of a lot of different gods and goddesses to revere. And the MFA has put up a, a fun uh, God's family tree on the wall for us to look at, and you should know that rules that apply to humans did not apply to the gods. Uh, Zeus and Hera, uh, for instance, are both siblings and spouses. There you go. Uh, now, in a section called Living with the Gods, I want to I want to just read the label text for you because it's just that good. Uh, they say this, imagine a world in which every aspect of nature and life falls under the watch of a different and often fickle divinity, and where your actions have immediate and tangible consequences. Natural disasters and good fortune were both seen as the result of your personal relationship with the gods. So it was something that the ancient Greeks thought of every, every moment of every day, pleasing the gods. Now, some of the birth stories for the gods and goddesses make interesting scenes because, as you can imagine, being supernatural, sometimes they had unusual birth stories. This is an oil flask, um, maybe just a little over a foot tall, uh, known as a lekythos. That shape is called a lekythos, and it features the birth of Dionysus. Now, according to legend, Dionysus's mortal mother died before she could give birth to him. So he was born by coming out of his father Zeus's thigh. And you can see the red arrow on the top there. And there's a tiny little face coming out of Zeus's thigh as he sits patiently on that stump. That's, that's Dionysus being born. Hermes, there he is, the messenger god standing nearby, is turning quickly. He's turning away quickly because he's going to take the child to safety. That's because Zeus's wife, Hera was not happy that Zeus had had yet another child with yet another mortal woman. The vase dates from the classical phase of vase painting. That's a pinnacle of their achievement. And I want to point out one area, a small area on the vase that shows us this convincingly. That's the bottom red arrow. That's Hermes' foot. This is foreshortening. This is the front on view of Hermes foot and shoe. It's very convincing. Artists have uh, achieved this ability to show us these 3D bodies in a deeper convincing space, even though we know we're looking at the flat surface of a piece of pottery. Now, one of the Greek gods that many people had that maybe love hate feeling for was Dionysus, who taught humans how to make wine and how to enjoy wine. 
This is a two-handled amphora, again, a storage jar with Dionysus, and it features him sitting and enjoying himself in a vineyard full of satyrs. You see the little tiny male figures there around him. Satyrs are those half goat, half man creatures who were Dionysus's rowdy companions. Dionysus is sitting there drinking from a high-handled cup called a cantharus, and he's surrounded by these swirling grapevines as well. It's beautiful. In spite of the importance of wine in their culture, and clearly it was a major export for the Greeks, the Greeks valued composure over passion. So the idea of getting drunk was something that they would try to avoid. One author says the Greeks were convinced that overwhelming disaster awaited a man who fell under a spell cast by the dark god of intoxication, Dionysus. So that might be the reason why uh, they were in the habit of mixing their water and wine together. And they, they did that in large, wide mouth vessels called dinos. Now, this Dinos is such an amazing piece. It shows the painter's ingenuity by painting boats around the inside of the rim so that when the Dinos was full of water and wine, the boats would sail on a sea. A wine dark sea was described by Homer. And that phrase, has led some folks to suggest that maybe the ancient Greeks didn't have word for the color blue. Why would they describe the sea as being wine colored? Um, but that's not true. The Greeks did have words for blue. Um, another person online um, wondered if, well, maybe it was the other way around. Maybe the Greeks wine was, was actually the color of the sea. Maybe the wine was blue. No, no. I think instead you have to imagine that it's poetic license, um, I believe. Now, Homer used a lot of epitaphs in the writing. And so he used things like bright-eyed Athena and wide-seeing Zeus. Uh, they didn't necessarily have to be taken literally. So I'm comfortable with wine dark sea as just being a beautiful expression. I don't have to worry about what color they were talking about. Now, to drink their wine, the Greek potters had some fun flexing their design skills. If you did indulge and you got drunk, well, you'd look like a donkey drinking from this. This is a drinking horn known as a riton, and you see the handle on the back. Um, imagine holding this up to your face and you get the idea. This is by the Brygos painter, who's really kind of a world-class, world-known painter in Greek vase painting. Dionysus as a, as a god was often pictured drunk, well, sure, that follows, and riding a donkey. And so if you were the drinker using this right on um, and you were holding this up to your face, you would, in effect, become an accomplice to Dionysus and be his donkey of sorts. Uh, and so beginning to sense the Greek sense of humor, I hope, because then there's this one. This form became very, very popular. It's also a drinking cup, but it's in that kylex shape, that shallow, wide shape with two handles. And this particular type is known as an eye cup for obvious reasons. Uh, it may be a representation of the masks that worshipers of Dionysus wore at his festivals. Uh, but once you raise this up to your mouth, which I, I love the museum for showing us a picture of somebody doing that because that's helpful. Um, it looks as if you're wearing one of those masks of Dionysus. So uh, I just think we have to know that they were enjoying themselves and, and they were able um, technically to do just about whatever they wanted at this point with paint and pottery. So you, now we've all heard of the Mediterranean diet, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's the wine, but healthy fish and olive oil. This was uh, their answer for staying in good physical shape, which was more important than just for looks. And we'll talk about that in a minute. 
uh, I always enjoy seeing these fish plates in museums around, and the MFA has a number of charming examples of them. The sides of this very shallow plate uh, slant downwards towards that depression in the center. And that depression, that's where the juices from the fish would, would gather, because imagine you're going to put your seafood, your dinner, on this plate so that as it's being eaten, the paintings are going to be revealed underneath. So the, plant, the fish juices might roll into the center, but they also could have used the center for um, holding their favorite condiment. And it wasn't just the Greeks favorite, but I think the Romans adored it as well. It was a fermented fish paste uh, and actually think it's coming back. Um, if, you, if you Google garum, you're gonna, you're gonna see that people are talking about it again in the, in the world of culinary arts, yikes. Uh, but it's a beautiful piece and it's charming and it shows us again, the Greeks are looking at the natural world as well as the world of the human body. So as I said, staying healthy and exercising was important because the human figure was really the dominant visual theme of Greek art always. Now it was Protagoras, the fifth century BCE teacher and philosopher, who is the person who said, man is the measure of all things. And we see that and here and in the other examples from the Greek culture. The first Olympiad, the first Olympic Games were held in 776 BCE. At this point in history, this is very early for them, the Greeks were living in many different city states, but these first games in 776 BCE had the power of coalescing the various states into one Greek speaking union. Sure, they were often rivals with one another and they would do battle in the future. But um, beginning in this eighth century BCE, they began to see themselves together as the Hellenes and distinct from the others, barbarians, um, non-Greek speaking people. They became a colonizing and seafaring people trading all around the Mediterranean. And Athens became, as mentioned, it became the center of uh, ceramic production, but it became the center of this new Greek nation. So at the Olympic Games, the museum notes, and we know this, that the champions of these games became wildly popular, famous celebrities, if you will, but they didn't get rich. That they were competing for the glory. And, uh, and maybe the prize would be a painted vase like we see here uh, and a vase filled with olive oil as the prize. And indeed, that's what this one was. It's a Pan-Athenaic prize vase in the shape of an amphora. And it features long distance runners running across the front. Uh, it's just inscribed as being a prize vase from Athens. These runners are competing, as I said, they think, um, scholars think it's a long distance race based on the form where they're holding their arms. Wrestling and boxing, of course, were also Olympic sports. And that's represented here in this shallow basin. And this basin would have been used for ritual bathing before athletic competitions. Uh, they've been found in graves accompanying the deceased, which is an indication for us that they were valuable pieces in a person's life. This was created from a single sheet of bronze, the main form of it, handle, hammered into shape within the rim added. And along the rim, we see these collection, um, pairs of solid figures wrestling head-to-head -head wrestling, literally their heads are jammed together, uh, who show these wrestlers along the edge. It's a beautiful piece. So it's time now for us to turn our attention to another major accomplishment of the Greek artists as they were representing and pushing their representation of the human body in uh, two dimensions on their vase painting. And they began to do it in three dimensions in small scale, like these little bronzes. We wanna, um, we wanna see how that expands. Uh, but really beginning um, as early as 800 BCE, we start to see some small three-dimensional 
figures and two of the very best ancient Greek bronzes in the world are in Boston. This is known as the statuette of deer nursing her fawn, very descriptive from the geometric phase. Stylistically, you can see that this is really a three-dimensional version of those painted animals that we saw on the geometric vases. This little piece was uh, excavated near a sanctuary, so it's most likely a votive gift for the god or goddess that was in that sanctuary. And it's a sweet little moment between an animal mother and baby. Um, Mother's Day is coming up. That's a sweet little thing to look at. Mom has a little bird perched on her back. That's what that is. But all of this charm and and knowledge about the human world comes in at, at just over, not quite three inches high, this little piece. And this is another little piece, but his importance is huge. Take my word for it. This little guy is one of the most renowned little men in art history, coming in at about eight inches high and dating back some 2,700 years. It's the Manticlos Apollo. He is a fully dimensional version of those warrior figures, for instance, on the Diplon vases. He's inscribed and it says, Maniclos dedicated me as a tithe to the far shooter, the bearer of the silver bow. You, shining one, give something pleasing in return. So Maniclos is asking for a favor from the god Apollo. Scholars aren't sure if the little figure represents Maniclos or if it represents Apollo. We won't know this because the arm is missing, the hand is missing what it was holding. Depending on what it was holding, it would have told us who that person was, but he's just a charm. Now, it's a few generations before larger sized human sculptures start to appear in Greek art. These monumental figures start in about 600 BCE, probably inspired by contact with Eastern cultures who had a historic tradition of large sculpture like Egypt and Mesopotamia. Certainly the Egyptians, and you can see an example here over on the right side from Cairo, certainly the Egyptians made statues of full-size men, but at their best, they don't really break out of the block that they're sculpted from. The Egyptians also did not depict their men in the nude and their figures were really meant to be seen from the front, possibly the sides, but not conceived in the round. You compare that with an early figure. Again, we've gone out the door of the MFA to, um, to step on to the Metropolitan for a minute. To compare that to the figure on the right, Koros means youth in Greek. And here's their example. These figures are the first large scale male nude statues that the Greeks begin to make. They are men, they are not gods. Now, some of them may have been set up in temple as votive figures, but we know that some of them are actually monuments to deceased individuals because they're inscribed as such. Now, look at his pose, and let me show you the one that Boston has. In Boston, we have the upper torso of a Koros. Now, even though it's incomplete, we recognize this pose. He would have been stepping forward with his left foot. We can tell that his shoulders are shifted slightly, and we see the muscles in his form, the muscles in his front, the muscles across his back. We can all, so it's starting to be very convincingly rendered in marble. His long hair in, 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 in long braids are hanging down, the braids are hanging in the back and we can still see lots of the original red paint. We begin to see that the realism of the body where it first shows up in Greek art is begun, to, begins to extend to the face. Um, we start to see portraits of real people especially in funerary sculpture. So this portrait realism, this realism of the face is a hallmark of the classical phase of Greek vase painting and of Greek sculpture. The Greeks practiced both cremation and burial when it came to honoring the remains of their deceased. 
Ashes were often placed in those big pots we saw, but later on in the classical phase, this type of thing developed. It's a marble version of the lekathos or oil container, but it's much larger, um, but generally the same shape as the earlier pieces. Um, ashes could be deposited into this vase, uh, this marble vase, and then the vase buried in the ground or even placed in a rock cut tomb. So this one is a large scale marker. We believe it's a funeral vase for that particular woman who is seated in the middle. Her name is carved over her, face, over her head, Nicagora. The man clasps her hand and their eyes lock in a farewell gesture. His name is, he's identified as well as a Timotheus. That's probably her maid who is standing behind her chair. And after scientific analysis, the paint colors have been revealed as seen in this colorized photo. So the new galleries at the MFA address a current hot topic. They call it the myth of classical whiteness. The original appearance of these sculptures was quite colorful, they say, even garish by today's standards. Most of them were brightly painted or decorated with gilding or even had precious stones added to them. After centuries of being exposed to the elements and centuries more of cleaning, they are white to us now, and that really leaves a false impression for us viewers. During the 18th and 19th century, Western art historians didn't know that the people, pieces had been colored, and they assumed that the white marble was a reference to the ethnicity of the people being shown, but museums and scholars around the world are correcting that notion. We've seen some tiny traces of paint here and there, but scientific analysis with spectroscopy and uh, special photographic techniques is showing us much more. So in Boston, they chose to concentrate their efforts with one large statue, and they've put nearby video screen so that we can see how she would look in, uh, in antiquity. This is Athena Parthenos. She's a Roman copy after a Greek original. And it's a good copy, we know that, because we know that the original statue was by Phidias. It was the centerpiece for the Parthenon on the Acropolis in Athens. And um, there are written descriptions about it, even though the original piece doesn't exist any longer. There were written descriptions of it in antiquity uh, and copies made in antiquity like this one. And we, we see a pretty good representation of her right here. And here's another view of her. She would have originally held a small statue of Athena Nike, the goddess of victory, in her right hand. And in her left hand, she's got a spear and a shield down at her side. So the, as I say, they've studied through scientific analysis the little bits of paint that remain, and they've created on video for us to see this possible uh, or probable original appearance for Athena Parthenos. Parthenos. Now, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they've taken a slightly different approach. Working with researchers in Germany, they had a few statues that were reproduced and then painted according to their findings. So we get to see a 3D version of these ancient, colorful Greek statues. The Met also points out that it wasn't just marble figures that were colored, but terracotta, and even bronze figures could be enlivened with paint, gilding, and inlaid material like jewels. Polychromy, from the Greek word meaning many colors, um, is certainly less apparent to us, as we say today on, on objects we see, but with this cutting edge scientific analysis and this research, we are beginning to see what these works looked like um, and the way that the ancient Greeks would have seen them. So we can see two reproductions here. The woman on the left, um, the original statue is in Athens. What their study found um, upon uh, looking at the original in the lab was that red and brown uh, plant-based colors were used um, or, and ground-based like red and brown ochre. Uh, 
Lead white was used for the eyes mixed with the skin and hair color as well. Uh, then their mineral colors being used. Her dress is a combination of orpiment, which was a bright yellow mineral mixed with cinnabar, which was a bright, uh, did I say yellow and red mineral. So, um, and you get this lovely orange dress that she's wearing. And then again, to the side on the right, we have a reconstruction of an archer. Um, look at the trousers, <laughs> look at the sleeves. Uh, that zigzag pattern was made visible by studying the piece under ultraviolet induced luminescence and raking light. Um, and they picked out and decided to paint this replica in Egyptian blue, green malachite and red and brown iron based colors like oxides uh, for this one of a kind outfit. Now the ancient Greek statues were painted, um, that's no denying that any longer. Um, and the whole purpose really for the coloring was to make them look more realistic. And I would add, make them easier to understand, especially those that were seen at quite a distance from the viewer. Um, this archer was in the pediment up above, you know, at the roof line of, of a temple. Um, and so I think having it be colored made it easier to pick out and easier to understand. So then I wanna end with this. Recently, there was a story from the BBC online that a child not identified uh, in the news story was given a blue crayon um, as part of a family activity packet at a historic home in England. Um, to, and they did some of their own coloring to an 18th century statue on the property. Um, it has since been cleaned up. You see the, uh, the you see the colored version there on the left and the cleaned up version on the right. It's been since cleaned up successfully, but uh, many of the comments online suggested, well, maybe this child uh, just you know knew that um, the ancient Egypt ancient Greeks would have would have used those colors anyway. So as we close, in a list of accomplishments that is impressively long, I think the Greek artist's greatest achievement was their development, uh, the representation of the human figure, which began with uh, somebody like this, Manticlos, and ends with their creation of true portraiture, which was an element that was heavily embraced by the Roman artists who followed them. So with that, I will say thank you very much for, uh, and if you have any questions or comments now, I'll do my best to answer. Thank you. So folks, let's give Mary a big virtual round of applause for another wonderful presentation. And let's take approximately 10 minutes of questions. So if anyone has any questions and comments for Mary, uh, get the questions into the Q&A, the comments into the chat. Okay. All right, let me look at the Q&A here. Uh, Angelina says, this was very informative. Cindy says, thank you. An anonymous attendee asks, what did they do with the ashes after the funeral vases were found? No, oh, good question. Um, well, most of that material really just, I think, disintegrates. I think it's fair to say um, some of the vases, uh, most of the vases will have been broken open and just broken from the weight of the earth or from being, in other words, rarely would an archaeologist find a completely intact face. So imagine that, yes, ashes went in in 500 BCE, but uh, 2,500 years later, when that piece is discovered, it's in little tiny piece, the vase is broken apart. So um, back to the earth most likely is the best answer. Uh, Pamela asks, who would have commissioned or owned the uh, wine and oil vessels? Oh, these were everyday objects. Uh, I can imagine that, you know, the fancier the painting was on them, uh, the more expensive they were. But these were everyday objects. The, the everyday Greeks would have their oil in a lekathos. Everyday Greeks would use storage amphora. They might not all be as beautifully decorated, but they were everyday objects for people. Uh, so now I'm going into the comments and I uh, realized uh, we have uh, folks from Ashland, Grafton and Raleigh on the call. I don't mm -hmm. think I had uh, mentioned those earlier. Uh, so Dory says, fantastic presentation. 
Frank says, bravo again, Mary. Great presentation. Susan says, thank you so much. Be well. Uh, oh. Jill asks, did the heart shape, which was found on the fish plate you showed, have the same meaning for the Greeks as it does for us today? That's a good question. Uh, and I don't, I don't know the answer. That's a good question. There are, with, I'm not going to zoom back through the slides because I think that gives everybody whiplash. Uh, they had a variety of motifs. Um, some of them um, do mean something. Some of them th that are laurel leaves mean laurel leaves for 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 victory for um, for praise. But uh, it's a good question. The heart shape. This is a time period of of um, scientific study. We had uh, ancient Greeks who. You know, Galen, for instance, who was a um, physician, uh, they're doing autopsies, they're learning about the body inside and outside. And um, it's possible that they had related that shape to an actual human heart by now. Uh, but I can't say for sure. I don't personally know. Uh, speaking of that fish plate, Catherine would like to know, was it safe to eat from? Was, uh, was the materials non-toxic? Uh, well, you know, uh, yes, I mean, yes, I, I think you could say that these materials were, I mean, the, the black is not a glaze. Um, so in our modern world, we don't use unglazed pottery uh, for food, but uh, in the ancient world, they did. Now the interiors could be covered in that slip. So in effect, it worked like a glaze. But technically, if I have potters in the group, I want to say I know it was not a glaze. So I would say it must have been safe enough, um, but certainly not for our modern standards. Uh, Janet says, thank you. Great presentation. Uh, Jill asks, uh, were the potters and the painters always the same person? Hardly ever the same person. So um, like the people that I have uh, named, like um, Ezekias, that's a painter, but he may not have been the potter. Uh, and Dacades was a potter. And the person who was responsible for the red figure is simply known as the Andacades painter, because we don't know that person's name, but he painted pots that were made by a potter named Andocades. So um, gradually we get more and more names associated, uh, written on the pieces um, and they can be the painter or the potter, but we generally can assume those are two different people. Uh, Elena asks, what about the actual textiles the archer would have worn? Were they woven or block printed or the pattern painted? Good question. I think it really could have been any of those. They did know how, I mean, weaving, a, another giant resource for the Greeks were, uh, was wool, sheep, and flax. And so um, they knew how to weave clothing. Uh, whether or not those, I don't know if anybody could answer that question about what their clothes, in what way were they actually decorated. We see we see images of them in colorful garbs or things with stripes. Was it painted on? Was it printed on? Was it woven on? It's a great question, but I'm not sure of uh, nothing. No actual artifact really comes to mind that we have left. Uh, if we do, it's tiny little threads that are maybe one color. Although in the ancient, ancient world in China, they, they have found plaid you know, <laughs> from the ancient world. So it was the ability to do it was was known. I don't know if the Greeks did. Uh, Carol says, thank you. Instead of just stopping to look at these Greek art forms in the museum, now I will examine them intelligently with knowledge. So that <laughs> well, was, it's a uh, great resource. Uh, yeah. for, I know not everybody listening today is close to the MFA in Boston, but it is a it is an amazing resource for us, those of us who are fortunate enough to live nearby. All right, so we're going to wrap up with two more questions, and they're pretty good ones, I think. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, are any of these objects up for reparation by Greece? 
Not that I'm aware of, and probably not. Um, but thank you for asking about reparation. What they mean is, you know, are any of these things contested? Is the ownership contested, or, or did they leave in um, under cloudy circumstances from their country of origin 200 years ago, 100 years ago? Uh, no. And the MFA is very, very good about um, stating on its website with these objects, as much of the provenance as they know, as much of the history of the piece, how it was uncovered and where, uh, and how it left the country of origin. Yeah. So and, and Mary, that, let me interrupt you. I don't know if I mixed up reparations with repatriation, but uh, or, or maybe there was a misspelling, but I apologize if I got the word wrong. No, but no, you, I, I, but the point is right. Do any of these things, are they being <laughs> contested by the country of Greece for return? Not, not no. Mm -mm. Yeah. And um, Joyce says, I really enjoyed this talk. Do you see any movement towards identifying more and more of the anonymous artists who created these amazing ancient Greek works of art? It's a shame so many of them remain anonymous to this day. It's true. Um, you know, in uh, storage rooms around the world at museums, there are millions of little tiny pieces of pottery uh, waiting for future art historians and grad students to get in there and put them together, rebuild pots. Um, we may see some more names come out of studies. It's a it's an active process and it's one that people would love yet yeah, people, the professionals and scholars share your interest in trying to find uh, more names to put together with these pots. Um, and sculptures, yeah. And Catherine says, fascinating presentation, many thanks. Oh, thank so, you. Mary, we're gonna wrap it there. Um, so folks, look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey, uh, a, a reference uh, references from Mary, uh, as well as um, a list of upcoming uh, virtual art history programs along with a couple of virtual armchair travel presentations we have uh, for Greece. So looking forward to that. Oh, Mary, good. we're going to see you in a few few weeks, I think in about yes. a month or so. Yes. Um, very much looking forward to that. I'm going to try to pull up the date and time. Uh, do you have any uh, last words for the audience, Mary, before we wrap it up? No, I don't. Thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, Mary will be back with us on Thursday, June 22nd yep. uh, at uh, 10.30 for a look at Buddhist art. So yep. very, very much looking forward to that one, Mary. Uh, yep. Thanks so much for uh, being so generous with your time and your knowledge this morning. And I hope you and the rest of the audience have a great rest of your day. Absolutely. So thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mary. Bye-bye.